All right, we'll get started. Thank you all for being here today for our webinar on Great Moms, Our Story. Uh, my name is Tim Hudson. I'm a behavioral health consultant for the Michigan Opioid Collaborative covering the Northern 21 counties. As you see here on the screen, we do have the QR code uh, for credit purposes. I'm going to post this as a PDF uh, periodically in the chat box throughout the course of the webinar. In addition to that, uh, the BHCs will be Baby Health Consultant, I'm sorry, from your region will be sending it to you on the coming days following this webinar. If you just joined, if you could please sign in the chat with your name, uh, place of employment, and your email address. Uh, you will have 48 hours to request to complete the survey for educational credits. Uh, if you haven't done so already, if you could please mute yourself as also. All right, so I'm gonna do a brief overview of the Michigan Opioid Collaborative, and then I will turn over to Dr. Poland. Uh, we're a grant funded program at the University of Michigan. We are funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan and Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We offer free same day patient consultations with an addiction physician in areas such as MAT inductions and guidance, options for chronic pain, obtaining community referral, re referrals and resources. We hold free monthly webinars and case consultations around poly substance use and treating different substance use disorders. Additionally, we host free, free education and trainings tailored to your office around uh, substance use disorders, MAT, technical assistance with MAT, office setup, and general addiction and treatment. We collaborate with Great Moms Model of Care to provide support and diagnosis and treating pregnant perinatal patients with SUDs. We also have a hepatologist on staff who provides education, case consultations, and we have a three-part webinar series on Hep C. And lastly, we participate in a number of community events, focusing on community coalitions to build connections and work to increase awareness on SUDs, the benefits of MOUDs, and reducing stigma. I'll now introduce Dr. Poland. Uh, Dr. Kara Poland is recognized expert in addiction medicine. She is a faculty member at Michigan State University. She earned her medical degree from Wayne State University and was trained in internal medicine at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and in addiction medicine at Boston Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. She received her master's degree in education from Boston University. She has an interest in educating healthcare providers and providers in training to improve care for patients with substance use disorders, particularly during pregnancy and early parenting. Dr. Poland, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Um, I guess I, I just really quickly wanted to, before I start, um, before I start projecting PowerPoint slides, which I know are everyone's favorite, but I see that literally not a single person other than Tim and I have our uh, videos up. So it's really hard for me to know if I'm like completely missing or hitting the target. So if, if I'm going in a bad direction or this is not helpful, please stop me and we can Re, and we can, I can be redirected. Um, and so just let me know if you have questions or you want to interrupt. It's a small enough group that I think we can manage to just kind of power through any questions that people have and and it'll it'll make it more fun if it's more interactive for me at least too. Um, so I am hoping that what we get out of today is that, um, people can kind of hear about our experience at Great Moms, and then hopefully that um, may give you ideas of directions you can go to, uh, go into, or ways to get things, um, you know, moving in your own systems, and also focus on um, where MOC may be able to provide some additional support um, through, through our, um, arm that helps with pregnant with with uh, treating pregnant people, um, which is also called great moms because I'm just not that smart. So I didn't make them have different names, which probably would have been smart. But the clinic I work in is called great moms and the support we provide people is to implement the great moms model of care in other healthcare settings. So I'm going to start by giving a quick little definition of addiction. So uh, according to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, addiction is a chronic illness. I know everyone here kind of understands that, and this is I'm preaching to the choir, but I think it's really um, important to remember that addiction is so multifaceted and that really one of the great things about working with 
people during a pregnancy is that um, I have yet to meet a pregnant person that doesn't want to do something to improve their health in the hopes of improving the outcomes for their babies. As my usual trait example is, I gave up Diet Coke when I was pregnant and breastfeeding. I gave diet up Diet Coke for like seven years. As soon as I was no longer pregnant, breastfeeding, or trying to conceive, you better believe I started drinking Diet Coke again. And it just does something to my own pleasure reward center. So it's it's kind of my way of sort of understanding and relating to my patients. Um, and in, a, like I said, a very trite way, I don't want to say, you know, I have nearly the, I don't have the disease of addiction that they, that, that they do and that they work through. But as a pregnant person, I think we almost, um, as a person who's been pregnant in the past, I know that I made changes to my lifestyle to try to improve the outcomes for that, for that child um, that I was, um, you know, that I was carrying or that I was trying to conceive. Um, and I think that as we open up the conversations around um, around substance use disorders, I try to remember and remind people that during a, during a pregnancy, that's kind of a, a very common thing, but for my patients, uh, you know, what they're trying to change in terms of their lifestyle also has implications and effects on their chronic illness. It's not unlike the person, I feel like I'm gonna sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry. I tried to move my microphone out of the way. Hopefully I didn't just sneeze in everybody's faces by mistake, but if I did, I apologize. But none of you have your cameras on except him and he's not wiping spit off of his face. So I think I'm okay from that perspective. Um, so anyway, but um, uh, I think we, I think every pregnant person makes changes in their lifestyle. And so one of the really cool things about working with pregnant people is that they are super motivated for change. Like all pregnant people are, because it's, it's like a, it's like a, it's a license to change and a license to do things new and a license to get support from people around you and from your, you know, your friends, your neighbors um, that, that allow you to really, um, that that allow you to just make positive changes in in your life. It's it's sort of similar to the person who has diabetes, and you know when they're not pregnant, their hemoglobin A1C is 15, and then when they're pregnant, they like follow everything, and their hemoglobin A1C by the end of the pregnancy is 10. And you're like, well, how did how did you do that? Why is this so different? You know, it's just it's just there's a there's a drive that happens um, when we are uh, conceiving that is. And, and when we have that pregnancy, that is just different than other times in life. Um, and I, I like to hope that we can maybe harness that and get people started on a different journey um, towards health and wellness, regardless of what the chronic illness is that they are working with, if it's a substance use disorder or not. Um, so let's talk a little bit about treating opioid use disorder in pregnancy. Um, we know that there's been a rise in opioid addiction, and that includes in pregnant and parenting people. We know that the rise of opioid addiction and the rise of overdose deaths has disproportionately affected people um, at um, at pregnancy ages, right? It's, it's the highest rates of death are in individuals between ages of, of 18 and 45, um, which exact kind of almost exactly, or is a little bit a little bit on the tail end of, of that age range. Um, but those are our most fertile years of our lives um, as humans. So it's uh, we want to make sure that we are that we are capturing and addressing these the, these individuals as they come to us. And again, during pregnancy, we have this unique ability to really bring people in um, and and get them surrounded and get them surrounded by the support um, by the support services that may best fit into their lives at that time. Um, we know that active and uncontrolled opioid addiction does pose uh, threats to expectant parents and their pregnancy. So we want to be uh, we, we want to make sure that we put in as many of those safety nets as we can. Um, we know that treatment of substance use disorders and OUDs in pregnancy, specifically with the medications that we can use to support um, the brain recovery, uh, benefits the community um, more broadly, as well as that individual, their family, and their baby. Uh, we tend to see that people who are successfully engaged in treatment and are doing well with their substance use disorder, we have lower rates of things like CPS involvement, um, and so that also helps us uh, kind of do a better, uh, do a better, do a better job um, as well. So, 
Um, we, we know that methadone and buprenorphine are both highly utilized in pregnancy. Methadone is um, not a treatment op option available in many areas of Michigan. That's a nice way to say it. Um, but as we all know, access to methadone can be pretty challenging for, uh, for folks, particularly in, in many of our rural communities, um, which, makes, which makes us lean toward buprenorphine. Um, we, uh, we know that buprenorphine can be prescribed out of an office by a provider with a buprenorphine waiver. So what we have to do is we have to have the ability to prescribe buprenorphine requires that we have a secondary license on any prescriber's uh, DEA license. The reason for this is there's a 1914 Harrison Narcotic Tax Act. And one of the provisions of that is that you will not prescribe an opioid to treat an opioid use disorder. So methadone clinics are one waiver of the um, of the Harrison Narcotic Tax Act and the Data 2000 waiver or the buprenorphine waiver or the X license um, are all the same words for the same, all different words for the same thing, um, are waiving the Harrison Narcotic Tax Act provision. If we were to go over the border to Canada, we would not have to have a waiver to prescribe buprenorphine. It is because of that 1914 Harrison Narcotic Tax Act. The good news is, um, we used to have to do additional education and training and submit that um, to the to SAMHSA if we wanted to get that waiver. They have eliminated that requirement for additional training if your goal is to treat up to 30 patients. Um, so we will um, so so we will. Uh, so we can now uh, get a waiver without having to do the education. If you want to go to one of the secondary waivers, either the 100 or the 275 patient limit, there are other there are other questions. Yes, Tim, I there I have some slides where we're going to go through the differences of those medications. So that's you're just queuing me up right for the next converse, next part of the conversation. I'm getting through the legal mumbo jumbo first, but they're just two different medications, and we're going to talk about when they're when they're used. Um, so what we what we know is that so 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 if we can get people waiver to prescribe buprenorphine, we can do it outside of a generalist OB, family medicine, primary care office, um, which which for the right patient might be more convenient for for them because they'll be able to get their care out of the same location at the same time. So currently in Michigan, um, there are there we have a significant gap in care for pregnant people who want treatment and cannot find a provider. So that's part of what MOC does um, is we will help people through those first few patient encounters and through any kind of complex questions. We also provide teaching and training for um, your, your staff uh, at, in, the, in the office or non-prescribers um, who, may, who may benefit from kind of understanding the disease of addiction because oftentimes when we're in a generalist practice, not everybody is doing the same thing, right? Otherwise, it would be real boring and people wouldn't get the care that they need. So we want to make sure that we are, we are able to help support you and your office through that journey. We also are fortunate here in um, here in Michigan that Blue Cross Blue Shield does have an incentive program um, to help off help offset some of the um, costs of starting a new program in your office. Um, uh, there's a separate one for people uh, that are providing pregnancy care and one for general practice. So if anybody's interested in more information about that, your BHCs can, can help give, you know, get you the information from Blue Cross Blue Shield. The nice thing about that is um, it is an op, it is an optional program through their practice improvement. Um, and I, I, it is payer agnostic. So it doesn't matter if your patients are, um, are Blue Cross Blue Shield patients or priority health patients or have some other kind of insurance, um, which is which is really nice. So that's kind of the administrative stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. I just wanted to really quickly. OK, I'm going to back up now. Sorry, don't close your eyes. Um, so in terms of the differences between um, buprenorphine and methadone, methadone um, by federal law has to be done in an opioid treatment program, and those um, are federally mandated, and so they require um, a person to go there six days a week to the location to get the medication um, because we cannot prescribe it. It is against the law to prescribe methadone to treat an opioid use disorder um, because of that Harrison Narcotic Tax Act. So what methadone does is it is a full opioid agonist, which means when it hits that opioid receptor, it turns that receptor on all the way. When it turns that receptor on all the way, 
it also lasts in that receptor for a really long time. So for substances of misuse, we tend to find that things that go into the brain and out of the brain quickly are more reinforcing to the brain. Um, so what that what that means is that if something, um, this is the same thing that it, which is why like, if I say to my eight-year-old, would you like a bowl of broccoli or would you like an ice cream sundae? Does anyone want to guess what she's going to pick, right? An ice cream sundae. She's not going to pick the bowl of broccoli. She is not lactose intolerant. So she's going to pick the ice cream sundae because that has simple sugars that go into and out of her brain that is rewarding to the pleasure reward center. Um, and, and when you have something that has the complex carbohydrates or lasts longer in the body, it actually is less rewarding to the brain. So it means that the brain doesn't like it doesn't like it as much um, as something that kind of goes in and out quickly. So the same thing happens if somebody uses heroin, they're often using four or five times a day. They're using multiple times a day in order to prevent withdrawal because as they as the heroin leaves their system, they start to feel cruddy. They start to kind of feel like they have the flu. If it gets bad enough, it sort of feels like a really bad flu with diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, a kind of a real bad GI bug, along with really bad insomnia. So withdrawal is pretty miserable. So what the methadone does is it binds to that receptor. It is an opioid. It binds to that opioid receptor. It turns it on and it sits in that opioid receptor and it stays around for quite a bit of time. And so it kind of acts like the salad that my kiddo doesn't want to eat as much as the ice cream sundae. It kind of gets stuck in there and it lasts for a while in the same way that, you know, eat more protein, it will keep you satiated, um, that does in our does when we eat foods. Um, and so methadone is highly regulated. It can only be done in these OTP programs. There's one in Gaylord, there's one in Mount Pleasant. There's a bunch in like some of our urban areas like Grand Rapids has three. There's one in Muskegon. There's a couple in Kalamazoo. There's some in Detroit. Um, and there is one in St. Ignace, uh, which just opened this year because we, before that, we just had no methadone clinics in the Upper Peninsula. You can, so you can see where somebody might need to drive five or seven hours to get to the methadone clinic. That's just not practical. It's not going to happen because you can't drive every day that amount of time and still be able to function as an as an adult in in a job with a job with a family with you know life responsibilities that's not really conducive to you know being to 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 being human um and so for people who are in more rural communities or communities where there is where the methadone clinic is further away from them they just tend to be more situated in urban centers because that's where they can get the meet their numbers of patients that they need um, to be successful. So they tend to not be in as many rural communities. Um, so that is what, where methadone comes into play. Buprenorphine is different because it is what we call a partial agonist, which means it essentially gets bound into that same receptor, but doesn't turn it on all the way, turns it on part way. And the fascinating thing about that is that for pers a person with an opioid use disorder, it has a ceiling effect where more medication doesn't really help, but also it's protective in terms of an overdose. So somebody is opioid tolerant in taking and takes more buprenorphine than they are prescribed or more than they should. I recently, like a couple of weeks ago, had somebody who called and said they ran out of medication early because they had a stressful day and they took seven strips of buprenorphine. They were that day in one day, they were supposed to take two. Like if they had done that with a full agonist opioid, they would have been at extremely high risk for an overdose. However, because it was buprenorphine, they hit the ceiling effect and they just derived no better benefit from the buprenorphine and they didn't overdose. They didn't stop breathing. So that was a, a benefit. It protected them. And then we could have the whole conversation around overtaking your medication and why we don't recommend that. And usually the patient's like, yeah, it didn't really do anything. So it's kind of negative reinforcing. Now, to be fair, if somebody is opioid naive, and they take the doses of medication that I prescribe every day, like if I were to take the doses that my patients take, I would be at risk for an overdose. So it is not that there is no overdose potential, it is that there is a ceiling, of, there is a ceiling to that overdose potential where if somebody is opioid tolerant, it doesn't matter how much medication they take, if they take more than that ceiling, they're not going to overdose and die. And I like not dead people when I'm talking about my patients. So it's a benefit, so it's a, it's a great benefit. Um, so I hope 
hope it looks like that may have answered Linnea's question. Thank you, because it's so, like I said, it's so much more fun if we can have a dialogue. So this slide is really just here to show that as maternal opioid use has increased, we've seen a concomitant increase in opioid withdrawal in newborns. So as we see, um, Maternal, maternal use increasing, we are seeing an increase in opioid withdrawal. This is national data. It is older. I recognize that. I don't know of newer data. I should probably convince um, somebody to publish that. Um, so what we know is that medication for addiction treatment during pregnancy is a recommended best practice for the care of pregnant people. I like to talk about it as a triad. We want medications, we want social support and we want counseling. I'm going to pause at counseling because if anybody knows me, they know that I am not a strong proponent of mandated counseling. And that is because if I say to Tim, Tim, you will go to counseling. And Tim says, no, I hated counseling. It didn't work for me in the past. I did it for six months. Is Tim gonna derive any benefit from that counseling that I just forced him to go to? No. No, and if I put him into group, like I put him into an IOP and he's sitting there with his arms crossed, looking at his feet. And every time the, the, you know, the, the facilitator asks a question or says something to him, he says, I don't care, I don't wanna be here. Is that going to harm the group? Potentially, right? Um, so I am not a strong proponent of mandated counseling. Furthermore, when we randomized it, when we said you will go to counseling, you will not go to counseling, you will go to counseling, you will not go to counseling, we actually showed that counseling didn't have additional benefit over medications and meeting with a prescriber alone. So I think that's because we randomized and we got a bunch of people like Tim sent into counseling that didn't want to be in counseling. Sorry, Tim, I'm picking on you. Um, but if I instead, if I said to Tim, hey, Tim, have you thought about counseling? And Tim says, um, yes, I would love to go to counseling. And I, I say, okay, great. Let's find you the right fit for a counselor. And we find that right counselor. He's absolutely going to benefit from that therapy appointment. Now, if Tim comes in and he says, I don't want counseling. And then in like three or four months from now, he's struggling and something happens. And he's like, I, I'm having more cravings, Dr. Poland. I need more medication. I'm not going to immediately jump to my medications and increasing my dose, I'm going to say, hey, Tim, what's going on? How about that counseling, right? We're going to talk, we're going to try to use some of, we'll, we'll do it in a more delicate way using things like, um, mo like motivational interviewing to help with those conversations. But yeah, we would want to kind of, we want to kind of bring people with us. Um, I, you know, I often, I often, have this like slight boundary issue with my patients called I reveal to them that when I was pregnant with my son, my mom died. And what I tell people is that like, I didn't know how to wrap my head around that. So I did what any smart person would do, which was get myself into counseling. So within two weeks of my mom dying, like at week 10 of my pregnancy, I got myself into counseling with a licensed therapist because like, dude, that is not supposed to happen. Right. And so I, um, I took that step and got and got counseling and got therapy. And like to this day, I think it was one of the smartest things I ever did because I like totally was aware that I had no idea how to deal with like my mom dying when I was 27. And I'll tell that to patients and I'll say, so, you know, I understand that the books tell me that, I, you know, I should send you to counseling and that counseling does have benefits. And, you know, let's talk about what your experience has been in the past. Um, but I'm also saying it because like, I have, I've had a really positive personal experience and I really hope that you may too. Um, so anyway, I, I totally digressed a little bit on my, on, on my story about counseling. I also tell patients pretty regularly that like, I think every pregnant person should just have like three visits with a therapist of some sort, just because like your life is going to change when that baby comes. I don't care if it's your first baby or your 10th baby. I found going from one to two was way harder than going from zero to one. I don't know if anybody else is with me on that one, but I like can't even wrap my head around the idea of going to three. Thank goodness uh, we, my, my significant other and I agree that we are complete. Um, and my youngest is eight. So knock on wood, he won't change his mind anytime soon. Um, because I really am set with my, with the number of children I have, but I can't imagine like how, you know, every time you have more children, every time you have another pregnancy, whatever the outcome of that is, I feel like we should be offering people therapy and counseling. Going from three to four was a big change. I, you know, it's funny you say that. Cause I often hear that going, that three is the big jump. And I'm like, I don't even know how people would do that because because I can't handle, I can hardly handle two. At least now I got a parent for each kid. Four, what do you do? I don't even know. I just, I, 
my brain, my brain, I can't handle it. Okay. Um, and then I put social support in that. Those are the people that are there for their, that are there for that person that maybe aren't licensed, that maybe aren't the people that we necessarily you start college. I'm not allowed to go back to school. I got my master's degree when I was after, when I was in my fellowship. I may or may not have started that when my son was 11 weeks old and finished it when my daughter was two months old. We're not going to talk about what kind of marker for insanity that is. But when I came home and told my husband that I was going to enroll in PhD courses the following fall, it was like April when I graduated, he looked at me and he told me that people stop going to school. I know it was remarkable because I had been to, I was in like 26th grade, if you just like keep adding. Um, and so apparently you have to stop going to school at some point. Tim, did you hear that? You might need that message. Tim just got his PhD, everyone pretty recently this spring. So I'm pretty excited about that. He might be less excited to like for me to announce that to like the whole group, but Dude, yes, congratulations. See, show Tim the love, showing Tim the love. It's pretty remarkable. Um, I'm not sure that I would have survived a PhD. So I just like to just point in, the, just, just sharing, just sharing. Um, okay. So here's what we know about five to 10% of pregnancies are facing signs of an opioid use disorder. And eight out of 10 people who detox off opioids while pregnant return to use within one month. Within one month. So detox isn't the answer. So that's why we need to get people on medication to treat a substance use disorder, to treat an opioid use disorder, either buprenorphine or methadone. So the next question that everybody has is why are we not using naltrexone? Um, we are not using naltrexone because at the end of pregnancy, there's this thing called labor in naltrexone, trade name Vivitrol, but in naltrexone is an opioid antagonist or opioid blocker. And if we use an opioid blocker that has a little bit of a long acting, um, has a little bit of a longer mechanism of action, and like, I don't know about anybody else, but as much as I really wanted to predict when I was going into labor, it just sort of happened and I didn't really get to choose. So in order to stop the, you would have to stop the uh, naltrexone, like they recommend six weeks before the due date. And then that leaves the person without any protection and at increased risk of overdose. Anytime we stop medication for an opioid use disorder, people are at an increased risk. And so in general, we don't usually recommend naltrexone. Have I done it before? Yes. If you are a generalist provider, I would say if you are talking about naltrexone during pregnancy, please reach out to MOC. Please reach out to your local um, addiction medicine physician if you, if you have one in your community. Community. If not, reach out to MOC and we will we will help you through that or um, help you through the discussion with the patient as well. Um, so in general, we treat, we treat opioid use disorders with buprenorphine or methadone. Um, for anybody who maybe doesn't know, buprenorphine's trade name is Suboxone, um, but that's the most common trade version. Um, and what these medications do is they stabilize the brain so that the person can, can kind of abate uh, the majority of those cravings. So it reduces cravings. It does not eliminate cravings. What you're really trying to do is get the person out of withdrawal. Specifically in pregnancy, in terms of cravings, we, we know that people just remember dreams more because we are slightly more arousable from sleep when we're pregnant. So we can be woken up from those, um, from those dreams, from the dream stages of sleep more easily. And so because of that, um, um, some people can have using dreams when maybe they haven't for a while or they haven't before. And so it's actually something that I provide as anticipatory guidance for people that you, know, you may find that you remember more dreams during your pregnancy. One thing that can happen with this is people can remember using dreams and that opens up a conversation around what they might do um, when they have a using dream. And don't worry, I have a social worker supervising all of my visits so that she can step in to make sure I don't say anything too dumb. Um, but we, I, you know, we kind of tag team that conversation, uh, you know, gen you know, generally. Um, but just making sure that people have kind of know can expect that they may have using dreams. And if they do have using dreams that they don't internalize that as something they're doing wrong in their treatment program or in their recovery, we wanna make sure that, you know, we wanna make sure that people can 
um, you know, have and also have some some potential coping mechanisms. So what you do in the middle of the night when you wake up, when you have and you have a using dream, kind of have those walk through those conversations a little bit um, with patients as well. Uh, we do we want to reduce the euphoria associated with illicit use. So once the buprenorphine gets in there, if people try to use other things because the buprenorphine gets stuck pretty well in that receptor, other other things aren't able to get into that receptor as well. So um, it means if somebody does use something else, they often don't feel anything because it can't get into the receptor, which can be protective because then they get kind of negative reinforcement where they kind of go, well, that didn't do anything. I'm not gonna waste my money um, in the future. So medication for addiction treatment um, improves other, um, other related uh, maternal health or pregnancy health um, care. So people that are on medication for addiction treatment tend to attend more prenatal care visits. So they tend to have improved nutrition, better, um, higher infant birth rates, as well as reduce um, uh, reduce exposure from uh, reduce exposure to infections related to infection IV drug use. And there's a question in the chat asking if we find that pe people tend to relapse after those using dreams. It is certainly a high risk time for people. So if somebody has a using dream, and they kind of they, if they haven't had kind of these using cravings and these using dreams in the past, then it it can be an impetus for uh, making for having an unhealthy behavior, uh, you know, the next day or uh, in that moment. So that's why we want to help them provide that help provide some of that protection um, for for people. So. Um, uh, that that's kind of what I'm what I'm getting at is we want to. Get, we want we want to surround them with resources and support that if they have that using dream, it's not totally unexpected, and they and they know what their plan is if that if that event happens, so that we can um, try to prevent them returning to using their using opioids or or whatever their substance of misuse is. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about stigma because it's like my favorite. Um, because I think it's really, really important when we talk about pre when we talk about pregnancy, right? Because um, you know we we see a lot of stigma um, around substance use disorders more broadly, and then when we talk about it more specifically in pregnancy, we see a lot of stigma um, against pregnant people who are using substances. Like, why can't they just stop? Why would you be on buprenorphine when you could just be you know opioid free, and then you wouldn't put your baby at risk? Um, we get those kinds of comments, and remember. Eight out of 10 people who we taper off of opioids return to use within one month during pregnancy. So we don't want to taper people off. However, I will say that if somebody comes to me and says they would like to be tapered off, I will taper them off and I will work with them. And I will constantly remind them that if they're if the taper is not going well, I'm happy to I, I would I would restart them on their medication or, you know, we might, we might just pause a taper at a given time. Um, we know that the dose of either methadone or buprenorphine is not related to baby's risk of neonatal abstinence syndrome. So meaning less medication does not reduce baby's risk of withdrawal. It's, it's an unrelated factor. Um, it's an enzyme in mom's placenta that changes the risk and we don't have a test for it. So I just tell patients, we don't have a way to know which babies are, are at more risk, but what we do know is your dose of methadone or buprenorphine is not related to baby's risk. Um, so the words I use is I want you on the lowest possible effective dose of medication, whatever that is. And that would be the same if you had diabetes, if you had hypertension, if you had, right, we want people on the lowest possible effective dose of medication. So I'm sure everybody's read um, the little definition of stigma on the on on the screen. So we want to avoid kind of pigeonholing our patients into um, uh, into you know into a negative frame uh, based on based on something like a substance use disorder. The words we use really really matter when it comes to treating people with a substance use disorder. Um, so we we don't want to, just like we've moved away from using the terms diabetic in medical nomenclature. We want to use person centered language and not use the word addict in, in in when we're talking about our patients we want to use words like a uh, person living with addiction a person with a substance use disorder um, what's fascinating is um, there there is a study that shows that the patient may come in or the client may come in and say I'm an addict and some of that comes from 
the AA, the NA, the Smart Recovery, the anonymous groups where there's where they're, where they're supposed to own their disease, but when, but they've actually done a survey where they asked people what they pre, what their preference was, and even though they came in and they said I'm an addict, they actually preferred for their health care providers to call them a person with a substance use disorder, um, and to talk about it as a substance use disorder as opposed to um, calling as opposed to using the terminology of addict. So I, I always tell people that because we don't always want to just use what our patients are using or what our clients are using, that that actually could be negatively perceived by them, which was really counterintuitive when I, for me, when I first read that study, I was like, wait, I thought that if I mirrored them, that I was, that I was doing the right thing. And it actually ended up that I was doing the wrong thing. So if there's other ways I'm doing the wrong thing. Please point it out because I will try to do better. Um, these are just some of the terms that we that we come across pretty frequently, um, terms to avoid using and then terms to use. I believe Tim is going to share um, these slides after the presentation, or you can access them if you would like them. So you'll have a copy of this um, if you, you know, if you feel like it would be helpful. Um, I try to stay generally away from the words clean and dirty. Those definitely have negative connotations. I am not getting upset with my kids for their dirty, for their clean bedroom. I'm getting upset with my kids because they've got toys all over their dirty bedroom, right? Um, so we want to kind of avoid using that terminology when we talk about our patients as well. Uh, I jokingly um, say to people, that there's only uh, one kind of dirty urine and that is UTI urine. And because it's got lots of bacteria in it, it sometimes has like gobbly goop from the kidneys in it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what I, you know, the reason I say that is we would never call somebody and say, hey, you have a UTI. And so we're gonna prescribe you some antibiotics to clean up that dirty urine. We don't, we don't say that. So don't use that kind of terminology with other patients. The terminology I prefer to use is either um, expected or unexpected results. You can see negative drug tests, positive drug tests, uh, drug detected, drug not detected. If I have somebody who comes in and their urine drug screen is positive um, for an unexpected substance, of course, um, I, I tell the patient that they're, so let's say it has, um, let's say it has methamphetamine in it. I say, well, it looked like your urine may have had some methamphetamine in it. Um, and sometimes the patient's already told us, and if they have, then I'm just like, okay, you know, we, we, that's a separate conversation. But if they're, if they say, no, that I didn't have methamphetamine in my urine, that test is wrong. I will remind them that it is a screening test that my point of care test that I am doing in my office is an inexpensive screening test that gives me information at the point of care in my office. And that as a screening test, it casts a wide net. And so what we're doing with that test is we're trying to see if there might be other substances in your system. But if you're telling me you didn't use methamphetamine, then what I'd like to do is I'd like to send it for a confirmatory test where they actually look at the chemical molecular makeup of what's inside the urine and then they can differentiate methamphetamine from something that looks close to methamphetamine and maybe popped our test positive here. And sometimes they'll come back, sometimes the results will come back and it'll be negative and the patient comes in and I say, you know what, looks like you were absolutely right. And thank goodness I didn't say to you, no, I don't believe you, but I'll say it looks like, you know, everything came back as we expected. Sometimes it'll come back positive and that conversation goes one of kind of two ways, right? The person comes in and says, you know, I was nervous to tell you, I was scared you're gonna change my treatment. I was really struggling. And today their urine drug screen is, you know, as expected with no meth in it. And we can kind of have that conversation about how, you know, I can't do, I, I can't be a good prescriber if, you don't feel like you can trust me. And so I'm, I'm just trying to help you. And if you're using methamphetamine, all it does is it helps me know where we need to take this conversation and how, and to identify additional supports that may benefit you to improve your health and the outcomes for you and your pregnancy. If it comes back positive and they still deny it, then it's a little bit of like a let's sit down and have a conversation about what a conf confirmatory tool is and why it's important that they understand that there really was meth in their urine and kind of give them like ideas of how that could have gotten there. Uh, you know, are they, you know, were they also positive for marijuana because a large amount of our marijuana supply also has other substances in it? Were they, you know, was there, is, you know, was there another way they could get it? And somebody who asked me if they could get secondhand meth smoke 
drunk? And I was like, no, not really a thing. So we kind of go through all those different options as well. Um, but in general, the key point is we don't want to call their urine clean or dirty. I have patients who come in time after time. It's the same thing. Like I'm an addict, my urine's clean. And I'm like, great, your urine is as expected. And they, and some of my patients like roll my eyes or they'll say something like, I know you don't use the word clean, but my urine's clean. Um, and again, it just trying to raise the conversation um, so that we are treat, actually using the words that um, are more impactful for patients. The other reason to do that is because we actually know that if we use um, if we use words like substance abuse um, versus substance use disorder, they've also done a study that showed that when we use the term substance abuse as, um, as healthcare providers, we provide worse care to our patients than if we use the terminology substance use disorder. It's, it's just a form of unconscious bias. We don't have any control over it. So that's why to me, it's so important that we kind of elevate the terminology we use because if when we elevate that terminology and we use safer, more inclusive language for our patients, we actually know that we provide better care for our patients. And it's a really easy way to provide better care. It doesn't require it doesn't require a Kaizen newspaper. It doesn't require an SBAR. It doesn't require much other than us kind of holding each other accountable for the uh, for using safe words for our for those around us. So I wanted to talk just briefly about our clinic more specifically and what we do. Um, so what we found uh, before we started our program was we did kind of an epic deep dive and we found that we could be sending these people to three or four different things or visits in a week at different locations. So an OB visit, an addiction visit, an ultrasound, a lab work, and that's without having, you know, gestational diabetes or any sort of complication to their pregnancy. They had a complication of their pregnancy, you know, that quickly can multiply supply. Um, and so what we found was that the patients were actually prioritizing their MOUD visit. One, because we were like, do not miss your MOUD visit. Two, because we use the carrot of the buprenorphine. When we prescribe the buprenorphine, the patient knows that when their appointment was aligned to with their prescription. So what I mean by that is if they were, if they were at, you know, 30 weeks pregnant and they were coming back every two weeks, they got a two week prescription. So they knew that they were coming back in two weeks to see us. And so that so we knew that they would make that appointment because they would have kind of the reminder of their medication. Now, if somebody has been stable for seven years, I still give them a month of medication. And I just remind them that their medication is not going to run out when their next appointment is. Um, but we started, but we found that people were making their MOUD visits and they were missing their OB visits. And at the time, the OB clinic was only like a mile away from the addiction clinic. So, you know, even when we tried to schedule them on the same days, we assisted with transportation, we still would have people, we would still have people that kind of fell off um, in, in getting to both appointments. And, you know, in total fairness, like what do pregnant people often also have? Other small children, we already discussed my inability to parent very effectively. So we know that I am going to say like, that would be really hard for me to get to, you know, to get to multiple appointments with my two children in tow. Like even today at ages eight and 10, it's a challenge. And oftentimes when we're talking about pregnancy, the you know, pregnant people, those babies are, those babies are, you know, younger and closer together. Um, so that so so we recognize that that was an issue. Also, if you're asking somebody to go do four different things in a day in a week, um, and they're working, like how many days off are we expecting them to take, and how accommodating are we expecting their places of employment to be? And many of my patients are also you know, not salaried workers, meaning they're hourly workers. So what are we asking them to give up in terms of their compensation and their ability to take care of their families, especially now as, as we all know with inflation creeping up and the cost of everyday goods um, really climbing, we know that people are spending, we, we know that people need to be working in order to be able to make those ends meet. Um, so back in 2017, uh, myself and uh, a nurse midwife, Nancy Renbugai, um, as a doctorate prepare, prepared uh, certified nurse midwife, uh, we got together and we were able to bring the Great Moms program into the um, into the MFM office. The reason we were co-located in MFM is not because these pregnancies are high risk, but because at the time they were the only OB office in our system that had um, both a, that had both ultrasound and OB capabilities in one suite. So because we wanted people to be able to get everything at one time. 
that was the location that we picked. Um, so we wanted to be patient friendly. We wanted to provide all our services in one location, and we wanted to be able to provide that follow up after the pregnancy. The reason the pregnant the follow up after the pregnancy was so important to us is that um, when we look at Michigan maternal mortality, um, we know that uh, the highest uh, risk time period for uh, postpartum is from about three months to one year. The mortality surveillance goes out one year, where 65% of our substance use disorder related mortality actually occurs between months three and 12. So um, after when we were reviewing this data is when we decided to extend our clinic out past that kind of traditional six or eight weeks postpartum to up to a full year. We also work very closely with the family medicine clinic that is um, adjacent to our clinic, like we share a break room type of situation, separate clinics, but shared break room. Um, and they will see the babies and they will see the, um, and they will also see the, uh, the, the mother, the family member. So occasionally we'll have like a, we'll have a non-pregnant parent or support person that comes in and has a substance use disorder and they'll get hooked up over there during the pregnancy, and at least they can kind of balance those appointments, hopefully a little bit better because the clinics are right next to each other. And then um, my social worker in my clinic actually sees patients in my clinic and in the um, resident and in the family medicine residency clinic next door. So when the patients transition between between clinics, uh, they they get to maintain a care provider, so they're so they maintain the thread of their story, um, and so they're. Just kind of changing their prescriber, but they get to keep their the, the social worker, which is really, really beneficial um, because a lot of times they have a very close relationship with our with our social worker. So um, we so so again, you know, that six week postpartum visit and then discharging back to the PCP, we found that we were losing our patients in the system. So after um, so after about a year of doing this, we decided that we were going to keep them for a little bit longer. Um, in 2021, when we looked just at patients that have a diagnosis of an opioid use disorder that made it to three or more prenatal care visits prior to delivering, um, that was our definition of enrolled. Uh, we delivered 18. Uh, we delivered 18 babies. Um, the average, you can see the average birth weight and the average gestational age. Um, they averaged 12 days in the NICU. We had two outliers. If we remove those two outliers, we average 5.7 days in the NICU. Um, and for uh, Eat Sleep Console, we require that babies are observed for five day, for a five day minimum. Um, and then here's this last piece is a piece of information I am most proud of. In a traditional OB office, the only about 40% of patients come to that six week postpartum follow up for, you know, mom's health. I tell my patients kind of tongue in cheek. This is where like Nancy looks to see if all the bits and pieces went back to where they're supposed to be after you have a baby. I know nothing about this other than I had two babies because I'm just an internist, but Nancy will like make sure all those things are right. Um, and then our program, you can see that our rate is, is uh, 75%, so nearly double average. I tell people it's really because we have that care to the buprenorphine, they wanna come in. We also have some funding. So we, uh, just before just before the due date, we're able to give them kind of a safety kit for their baby. It's a, it's a, it's a, a diaper bag that opens up into a safe sleeping space or a changing table. Uh, we put in some safe, safe sleep sleepers. We put in a, uh, like a receiving blanket um, and then it has a baby safety kit like a thermometer and such as well as a, um, a child proofing kit. So like the little like things for the outlet covers and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so people kind of know that that's coming. So people get real excited about, about that little gift that we're able to provide them. Um, and then at the six week postpartum visit, if somebody is still, if somebody has um, resource concerns, um, we're able to help them um, obtain resources. We were fortunate to have a private donation of $30,000 that allows us to do that. Um, so all patients have a right to help and treatment, caring conversations and relationship building, and a feeling of mutual trust and non-judgment with their, with their care providers. And that's really our goal in the Great Moms program is to help our patients feel that way when they're treated by, um, by our care team, but also as we extend the Great Moms model of care to other collaborating clinics or other people who want to treat us. Uh, pregnant people during, with a substance use disorder, we hope that um, we hope that the patient perspective will, will remain the same. So um, 
you can always email your uh, BHC for more information um, about the about the Great Mounds program, or you can email Angie DeSantis, um, who's another member of the MOC team, uh, for more information, whichever works better for you. Um, so here are the incentives I was I was talking about. Um, so we have um, so so we can send more um, additional information. Um, we can either connect you with Blue Cross or we can we can send you more information about that as well. Um, so we, you know, we've been providing our service for about five years. We've had BBACs, I call them. We've had second pregnancies, many of them now. I think that's kind of the most fun to me is when somebody comes back with another pregnancy, I get to see their toddler. And I also know that I probably more likely made a positive impact because she returned, because that pregnant person returned for their prenatal care a second time with our team. Um, so uh, we hope that we are making a difference. Um, I end all my talks to all the people who have lost their lives to addiction and those that try to prevent further losses. Most of, uh, many of the, the names in the chat were somewhat familiar to me, um, but for those of you that don't know me, my brother died of a self-inflicted gunshot wound secondary to an alcohol use disorder. So I dedicate all the talks that I do to his memory. Um, and I wanna thank you for being here today because if by being here today, we, we make one positive change in our treatment of people with a substance use disorder, then I've done something positive in his memory. So thank you for taking the time um, this afternoon to be with us. And I think I left the number of minutes I was supposed to, oh, I'm short a couple minutes on questions, but Tim will yell at me later, I, I assume. Now that he has his PhD, he can, he can yell at me and I have to quake. Um, but I, we can we can open up for some open up for some questions. Hopefully on a Monday afternoon. I haven't been too jocular. And thank you, Tim, for letting me pick on you throughout the entire presentation. But no one else had their cameras on, so I had to. It's quite all right. I understand. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Poland? Okay, well, if nobody has any other questions, uh, we will uh, end a few minutes early. Uh, again, uh, the local behavioral health consultant will be reaching out to you uh, in the next day or so to follow up and provide you the PDF for credits, as well as a copy of the slides from today's presentation. Uh, we thank you all for being here today. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. <laughs>